just do this thing. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Yes. Yay, good. Um, and I'm unmuted. Okay, you are my first COVID presentation. So um, I'm excited to talk to you guys. Let me make, sh let me disappear myself because that puts me off. Um, <laughs> Like Trish said, it surprised me this weekend. We were filling out college application forms for my daughter and she asked me how long I'd worked at the garden. And I've been here for around 20 years, which kind of blew me away. Um, so uh, I work at the South Carolina Botanical Garden. This is the state botanical garden. We're here in Clemson. Lots of people think that we should be in Columbia, but we've been the state botanical garden for about 20 years. Um, this is our brand new entrance. It's been put in over, I think about three years ago, we had this added. We had a lot of, um, oftentimes people would come to the botanical garden, they drive down the road before this was put in and they go, where is the botanical garden? So this has really made it um, more of a defined space and lots of South Carolina native plants in that front entrance. Uh, the topic of my talk is transforming a landscape with native plants. And really it's, a, it's that, but it's much more than that. Um, over the past 10 years, what we've done is put a trail down the middle of our botanical garden, uh, joining together two ends, and actually recreated the major habitats of South Carolina. So you can walk within the botanical garden from the coast of South Carolina through the coastal plain up to Columbia, not quite as hot as there, but up to Columbia, <laughs> and then through the Piedmont and up into the mountain habitats of South Carolina. So when I was thinking about talking to you about this, um, I wanted to, what I started from was the fact that some of the habitats were already here. We had some mountain habitats already in existence. Um, but what I'm going to talk to, oh, hang on, let me work out how to do this. There we go. Um, this is a map of our garden. Um, we have 300 acres. We were started over here. Um, this wasn't a duck pond. This was the university dump. And um, the garden was started in the 19, 1950s when they moved some camellias to the site because they wanted to expand football parking you know everything at Clemson is about football um, and so this was the most um, visited area of the garden people would come feed the ducks and then go home well about 20 years ago over on this end of the garden at number three we built a visitor's center um, and that visitor's center was the Southern Living Showcase home and at that time this area that's outlined in green was basically just grass. It was a monoculture and that's all fine and dandy, but because we're having people come into the garden from here, going along this road, this grass had to be maintained. And so it had to be mowed every single Friday. Um, and we had to, and that's the problem of having human power, having the time, but also having the pollution and the use of fossil fuels. So that was something that we really wanted to do away with. Um, so all those little A, B, C, D, E, F, nothing of that was there. Just, oops, just to give you an idea of scale, that round circle, that green right, round circle right there is 10 acres. So that gives you an idea of the spacing that we're talking about. So we had this one problem, which was that we had to do all this maintenance um, when, Pat, when the person who conceived of this came, we were down to one mower. So um, the other thing to think about with our botanical garden is that we have 300 acres. We have the most staff we've ever had right now, and we have six horticultural staff to keep up 300 acres. Um, so staffing was a problem. So that was one problem. The other problem is main area of the garden is right here. People come visit, nothing over here. And we put our visitor center here. <laughs> um, not the best planning, but I wasn't in charge at the time. So, um, but anyway, so we have this disjunct. 
let me show you a visual. This is, um, this is my daughter is 18 now. This is my daughter in the middle running down this slope and the project had just begun. You can see right here, there's a little longleaf pine tree. So it's a little bit into the project, but that gives you an idea of the grass that's here. And here's our visitor center. So what am I gonna do in this talk, which is what I should have said at the beginning. I'm gonna take you on a walk of our natural heritage trail. And we're gonna start at the maritime forest and we're gonna walk up through this area that we've created. Um, so we've taken this pretty much bare landscape and by the end, you'll see what a huge transformation we've made. Um, along the way, I'm going to pick out a few plants that I think are of interest, that I love. Um, and hopefully, that'll be fun. Okay, so this man became our director a little over 10 years ago. His name is Patrick McMillan. You might be um, aware of him from expeditions with Patrick McMillan uh, on national public television. Um, he was the man with the vision. He talks about sitting in his office, which is actually my office right now, um, looking out over the space and wondering what he could do and coming up with the idea of the Natural Heritage Trail. Not only did it address those issues of upkeep, and connection, but also solidifying us as South Carolina's botanical garden. So um, unfortunately, I'm trying to say this without crying, he um, took another position this month and he has moved out to the West Coast. So he is now the director of Heronswood Garden out in um, near Seattle. So anyway, this is him in his natural habitat of lots of beautiful native plants. Uh, this is the Natural Heritage Trail. This is the end we're not going to talk about. This is the end that was, um, we took the existing woods and we've created some mountain habitats. Um, but that gives you an idea of the sign and the, what it looks like. My part of all of this has been, as education person, developing the signs. So we wanted to have it so that people who walked the um, Natural Heritage Trail would have information. Um, I go to these conferences and they say that people very, very rarely read signs. And I've been very pleased because I do see people reading these signs, which is nice. Um, there's the visual, there's the words there, but also just behind his elbow right over here, there's a QR code. And so you can go to that QR code and you can go to um, information online, but also uh, videotapes of Patrick talking you through the space, which is a really nice touch. So this is my part of it. Um, online, move that. Uh, these are the ecosystems of the Natural Heritage Garden. Um, and we're gonna visit some of them, but not all of them, like I said. Um, oh, darn it. Okay, so. This is, some of you talked about being down at the coast. I know you are, Trish. This is a photograph I took um, down at Edisto Island. This is the maritime forest that we wanted to recreate within the botanical garden. Not just individual plants from that space, but the whole community. And um, let me show you how we started. Okay, this was probably seven years ago. Um, we started with putting in the overstory. So you can see we've got the palmettos, we've got a magnolia, and in the middle we have a southern live oak. This to the, I'm not going to talk about this at all really very much, but I just wanted to point it out to you. This right here is a Native American shell ring. Um, and so we wanted with this trail to connect not just the plants, but the people to the story. And so you'll see a little bit that through the way, um, how people have used the land and how people have interacted with the plants. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. So this is what we started with. This is a little bit later. We've added in an understory. You can see in there mooly grass back in here. Trees have got a little bit more. Um, <laughs> the palmettos look an awful lot better than they did in the first slide. Um, 
we've got our sand to recreate the habitat, and um, then there are yopon or holly or um, ilex vomitoria in here. Um, and this was, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, you can see how much lusher it's got. Um, that red tree right there, I think, is a sugar maple that is, or it's a chalk maple that's on the, the Native American shell ring. So um, that's, that's kind of a cool thing. So everything is big and lush and beautiful. And it's even more so this year. Um, so I wanted to talk about a few plants um, that I like. Um, I'm not, I hate to say this, but I'm not hugely fond of the palmetto. <laughs> but the, I mean, it's lovely and all that, but the tree that I really like the most is the Southern um, Live Oak. And we planted these trees along this border, along this walkway, are uh, southern live oaks. Um, and then this is, this is a pathway lined with mooly grass. Uh, the southern live oak, any, uh, any oak is good for um, wildlife, uh, birds eating the birds and animals eating the acorns. Um, live oaks are really good because they have a, a dense canopy and so they're very um, excellent for uh, protection for animals. So I wanted to focus on the live oak. The other thing to say about live oaks, which I think, I don't know if Trish, we just mentioned it recently or in the conversation earlier today, live oaks are promiscuous and mm. there are many, many, many of them. So if you have a garden in South Carolina, you can probably find an oak that will fill, fit with your habitat um, throughout the state. When I walk this, with this walkway with people, I talk about how the um, avenues of oaks down at the coast are just so beautiful and it's gonna be, you know, how many hundred years before we have that here at the garden. But these trees went in as sticks probably two or three years ago and they've already got some nice growth on them. So they actually, oak trees actually grow quicker than you would think. Um, so that was one tree I wanted to focus on. Just as an aside, the building on the top there is our um, visitor center. Um, and the building, the little tiny building, that window right there, that's my office. And then the building below is the geology museum. If you've never been here, you should come in when you can and visit. Okay, the Palmetto. As much as I don't value it really that much, it is an, a wonderful addition to your landscape um, it looks out of place up here, but it's here in our garden because it is part of the heritage of South Carolina. But this is a wonderful plant for pollinators. It has huge sprays of flowers on it in the spring. And then it's wonderful as plant food. Those, those flowers, once they're pollinated, become an incredibly rich food for birds and small mammals. So it's a wonderful tree. Um, well, actually, it's a wonderful grass, but... Um, so that was one plant I wanted to mention. Muley grass. This is what I had mentioned a few minutes ago about the connection between people and place. This is another connection between people and place. This is the sweet grass that's used by um, African-American weavers down at the coast, basket makers down at the coast. Um, and we wanted to showcase that plant and that connection between people who have been forcibly moved and bring their traditions with them. I had actually been looking at the mooly grass a couple of weeks ago and thinking, I wonder when that flowers. And then this week, it looks like that. So um, it's a beautiful plant for structure. Um, it creates that beautiful wispy look and the color is phenomenal in the pink and then the white together. Apparently it's a very good plant for encouraging ladybugs to your you're a garden. I did not know that. So that's one thing to think about. The third plant in this section that I want to talk about a little bit is the Ilex vomitoria or the Yopon holly. Um, the people connection for this plant is to the Native Americans of the Southeast and they use this they brewed the leaves for something called the black drink that they used ceremonially. It got a, the people who are watching them saw them get 
drink this drink and then throw up, but actually apparently it's not that it's kind of, uh, there's a whole process. It's not just the, the leaves that make you throw up. Um, but this plant, the leaves do have a high con, uh, con caffeine content. So they, they've got the highest content of caffeine of any native plant here. So, um, and Native Americans prized this so much that they actually had plantations. So they moved it from the coastal plain up into the upland areas of the South and North Carolina. So um, this plant does well at the coast, but it also does well here. And actually you'll see that even though we've tried to make that connection to place, we've sort of moved the plants a little bit away out of their traditional habitats down from the coastal plain up to the upstate. Um, and they seem to thrive. We do have little worries um, when it gets really cold, whether we're gonna lose our palmettos, but we haven't so far. So that's pretty amazing. Okay. So you're on this boardwalk, you've walked up to, through the maritime forest and you're now in the longleaf pine habitat. This habitat in South Carolina at once dominated the low country. It was the, the prime habitat all the way up to the fall line. And um, it was preserved by Native Americans who burned it every year, every few years uh, to burn out the hardwoods and encourage the lush herbaceous, um, the layer. And you can see these beautiful longleaf pines on the left here. Um, this is another aspect of longleaf pine habitats where it's become really soggy and there's an underlaying of clay and in those habitats, you find carnivorous plants. And you can see these are all um, pitcher plants out here. This is actually in a right of way and a, uh, a power line right of way where some of these little fragments of habitats have been um, preserved. This is the extent traditionally of the longleaf pine. So you can see how much, how far it went up. We have approximately less than 10% of this habitat left for suppression of fire, development, all kinds of things. So we've recreated this whole habitat and I'll show you that. Um, this is the boardwalk walking into our longleaf pine savanna and on either side are these bogs that we have constructed. This was so neat as, as a person watching this um, on a, it was a Labor Day weekend. I went home on Labor Day and I came back and they had constructed these bogs and they had put these plants in. And what had happened is they'd gone down earlier in the week to an area in the low country where they had been developing an area and they just cut these squares of soil out of what was gonna be destroyed, brought it up here. So we didn't know what we were gonna get. And we got this wonderful, beautiful array of plants and flowers. Um, you can see the pitcher plants in here, um, the meadow beauty. Um, this is actually one of the most um, diverse habitats in the entire world, aside from the uh, rainforest. So it's absolutely packed with hundreds of species, or many, many species of plants. Um, so, Okay, I wanted to share this with you. This is my new favorite plant in the whole entire world. And I don't know why I like it so much. Um, it's often covered by pollinators. It is, um, it's an erygium. And this is a very specific one, the Ravenellii, which actually Patrick found and has given to woodlanders to cultivate who are nursery. Um, it keeps a beautiful color like that. Uh, you can see it up here in our uh, carnivorous plant garden. So that's a plant that I just wanted to mention to you. Um, we have a newsletter that we put out every three months or so. And the, the newsletter this year or this, this month has a article about making a bog garden just like this. So if anyone's interested or I can send it to Trish, I have that information. Even though they seem so exotic, as exotic and so difficult, different, they're very easy to maintain um, with very little care. Okay, walking a little further. This is a word that I had never heard until we had started this um, project. A pocosin, 
is an Algonquin word and it means swamp on a hill. We're up to almost Columbia. This is an area where um, the sand overlying clay and wherever the water comes down, it hits that clay level and starts with these seepage areas. And this was where I was, this was several years ago over here. This was last week. You can see this amazing wow. shrub layer. Yeah. Oops. Backwards, go backwards. Um, it's, it's amazing to see how much it's grown. Um, there's Eastern, there's Atlantic white cedar up here, lots of swamp bays, uh, lots of small shrubby things. It's a pretty neat habitat. This bush through the summer has been phenomenal. Sweet pepper bush. Um, it has flowered and flowered and flowered. And as you can see by, by my bee um, photograph, um, it's just covered in bees. And then once it's finished with pollination, uh, being pollinating, pollinated, God, um, it is covered in seed and it has um, lots of uh, value as a wildlife plant, as a food for um, wildlife. So that's my, my pick for that little space. If you haven't been to the Sand Hills National Wildlife Refuge, you should go. It is the most phenomenal um, habitat. These long savannas again, areas of grassland with trees, another fire maintained habitat. This is wire grass. Um, unfortunately, part of, the, we do, we do recreate these habitats, but we haven't got the wild, always got the wildlife aspect to them. So this comes with red cockaded woodpeckers and go gopher tortoises. So we don't have those up here, obviously, but um, it's a wonderful habitat. Um, this is how it started out. Um, wow. Yeah, just these little tiny, I, had, I should have put it in. I have a wonderful picture of my children petting the longleaf pine trees. <laughs> They're so beautifully soft and wonderful. Um, but you can see, if you look behind the pine trees, you can see right here, that boardwalk is where all that um, bog garden was that I just showed you. So you can see back then how quickly that's grown up. Um, and then this is what the sand hills looks like. Um, I think that was last year. That's last week you can really feel like you're walking through the wire grass up through this, these longleaf pine trees. Um, it's just beautiful. This is the habitat that's right around Columbia. This is where you've got your turkey oaks and your longleaf pines, and it is a brutal, brutal, brutal habitat. So the plants within this habitat um, have to really adapt to that very hot temperature and if you've ever seen turkey oaks, they often hold their leaves um, instead of horizontal, they'll, leave, they'll hold them vertically um, to protect themselves from that intense heat. Um, these are some of the plants that are in that particular habitat. These are the ones that I have on the sign. I wanted to make an aside because what I've noticed at, as I've been doing um, working on plant profiles for our Facebook page and I've been thinking about the plants that are all along the trail. Um, there's a number of plant species that have lots of different varieties that work um, in many different habitats. So obviously y'all are uh, um, familiar with milkweed. This is the Sandhills milkweed. We have common milkweed up at um, that grows really well here. And then there are other species of milkweed all the way that you could find an appropriate one for your garden. The same is true for goldenrod. When I look it up, um, and it's a resource that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit that has all the native plants for South Carolina, North Carolina and Georgia. There's something like, I think it's like, I should have written it down, I can't remember now. There's something like at least 30 species of goldenrod through the whole state. So you can probably find one that will do really, really well for you. Um, I just like this picture of the dwarf huckleberry. I thought it was just so pretty. And any huckleberry is always gonna be a wonderful plant to um, add for wildlife. And it's beautiful, which who doesn't like that in their garden? Mm. 
Okay. This is a weird habitat, but I wanted to show it to you anyway, because this is such a beautiful um, picture, but also a granite flat rock is a really unique habitat. The plants in this habitat are going to be really, really um, cast iron. They, can, they almost can um, survive anywhere, but you may not want them in your garden. The plant at the beginning, at the front, the yellow is a ragwort and it's beautiful, but we all know about ragwort and pollen and so forth. Um, so that's a really pretty plant, but, and I would have it, but you know, um, <laughs> I don't know if everyone would. Uh, a lot of the plants in this habitat are tiny. They're the things that are out on 40 acre rock, the very small um, L-forpines or the very small um, pucks. Ooh. Alpine, and I can't think of the other name, but very tiny things, things that have to live their life in a very specific habitat. But the plant I did want to mention that might you might want to consider for your garden is this purple one that's hanging out in the back. This is the hairy spiderwort. Spiderwort, again, or dayflower is something that have is got different kinds that work all the way through the through South Carolina. This one is pictured over in our children's garden and it just was beautiful and lush. I know people are often thinking about spiderwort is very um, leggy. This one is just, just a beautiful specimen and I just fell in love with it in the spring. Um, and you see the hairs on it that shows you the ad adaptation to that intense heated environment because it's trying to keep some kind of um, almost like having an overcoat on, but maybe just chilling itself down. So that's a, an, a lovely, um, another plant that I would really like in my garden. Okay. Does this look like South Carolina to you? <laughs> um, this is not South Carolina, this is out West. Um, but actually we've gone through the fall line and we're up to the Piedmont of South Carolina and a lot of the Piedmont in South Carolina was actually a prairie. Um, Mark Catesby in his History of Carolina talks about bison um, roaming through South Carolina being pursued by wolves. Uh, the state historian in the 1850s talked about, about how a hundred years ago, four or five people could go out for a day and bring back several buffalo or bison. Um, they were that that common and yet we don't have them anymore. The habitat that they would have been living in is this. This is that grassy area I showed you at the beginning with the children running down the slope. Um, this is now our Piedmont Prairie and you walk through it and the grass is above your head and grasshoppers just jump at every step. You've got, they're just amazing. There's so much life in this space. Um, we were very lucky. Much of the Piedmont of South Carolina has been cotton farmed and, and we, as, as they farmed and they were not able to put back, um, fertilizer into the soil. And they also just had a lot of problems with erosion. A lot of South Carolina's topsoil is down with you in the low country and we don't have very much left, but this habitat was always, um, grazed and a little bit of an orchard on it. So we actually have a intact soil horizon in this space and it's about three feet deep. So we have a really nice um, soil here that we're able to grow these beautiful grasses on. This is, um, this, this in particular, this habitat has changed the way the, um, at the bird population and so about 10 years ago when we started this project we had about 100 bird species now we have um, over 200 so we've really changed added to the bird population that we have one of the things we've added is great horned owls who are feeding on things like uh, grasshopper sparrows and meadow larks which are plant uh, birds that we hadn't seen ever ever up here or certainly not recently. Um, so that aspect of it has been 
really rewarding that we've really added some new species that we've not seen before. Um, I have not seen the great horned owl, but I hear that it's here. I have been lobbying for um, one of these. <laughs> but, um, nobody said yes yet. So um, that would be nice to reintroduce bison into the botanical garden. We have talked about getting a metal one so that we can make that connection. Um, so these are some so, of the, okay yeah. these are the grasses that are in these the are some, some of the grasses yeah um indian grass is a south carolina state grass um blue stem beautiful color purple top again lovely color um grasses are something that i have never really considered as a gardener but they are really wonderful in the sense that they give you such drama and such upright um verticality in your garden and then the color is just stunning um were you going to ask a question trish no i just was going to ask what kind of grass but you've answered oh, there you go that's some of them um there's a uh, little blue stem as well there's um there's a couple of others but these were the main ones i pulled out then within these grasses we have these composites um, some of these are very, very rare, very endangered. Georgia aster is something that is actually endangered, but grows a lot around here. It's endemic. So um, they tried to get it on the endangered list, but it didn't get on because there's so much around here. It's a gorgeous plant and it's in flower right now. It's really pretty, as is the Schweinitzer sunflower, um, which is right there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, these, now, is that a tall growing sunflower? It's about five feet. Okay. It's not like it's, most of the helianthus are five to ten feet tall. Yeah, it's not like the swamp sunflower, so mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit more restrained than that. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered some of these things. You wonder about how you can take them from the. Obviously, you don't take them from the natural environment, but how people get them from the natural environment into the nursery trade and how they can be approved. Um, I wondered about the Schweinitzer sunflower, and actually that's available at some of the native plant societies. Um, someone talked about how they had gotten some of the plant from the North Carolina Native Plant Society. Um, so your native plant society often have plant sales and they're tapped into this kind of plant material. And so they're a really good resource for, for some of these things. I wanted to mention the smooth comb flower. When I first came to the garden, echinacea was the hot thing. It was the native plant. And it was um, sort of the poster child for native plants, put in your echinacea. Uh, and I know for a while that we had all kinds of echinacea here. And then you started seeing in gardening magazines, you know, this kind of echinacea and that kind of echinacea and this purple one and this pink one and this orange one. Um, we have actually taken all of the echinacea out of the garden except this one. This is federally endangered and it's, we want to preserve it and it hybridizes really, really quickly. So we have moved exclusively to this smooth comb flower, which is, it's not as, um, I like it actually a lot more. It's very ethereal looking, so, um, so, there are some shades within native plants. So you've got, um, there's a lot of politics in everything, as we all know, and even plants, there's some politics about it. So I wonder if I took out the slide. I took out the slide. Okay, I'm sorry. The one thing about this habitat too, and I mentioned about the uh, longleaf pine savanna is fire. Um, and we actually burn this prairie every single year so that we keep any woody plants out, that we maintain this um, lush green grasses. And um, yeah, so if you have up here in, October, in February, we burn the prairie and it's, it's quite something to see. Uh, and you do that in February at the very beginning of the season? We do, um, and actually I say come up and see it, but it's really hard to see because it's a very difficult 
the wind has to be exactly right. Mm -hmm. The humidity has to be exactly right. And it can be decided on the morning. So actually my husband's never seen it because he never gets notification. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a pretty amazing thing to see. Um, all of this is, has, has happened so very quickly. It amazes me and it gives me hope as a very lazy gardener that um, some of these things have happened so quickly and the environment has changed through um, changing from this monoculture, from this grass to adding all this huge biodiversity. We have really changed the amount of animals that come to the garden. So I mentioned the great horned owl, but we've also added a lot of citrus. So we've now added to the garden um, giant swallowtails. We had never seen giant swallowtails before. So now we have giant swallowtails. We've done some other things as well as changing the plantings. We do not spray unless we possibly have to. So we, um, we don't use chemicals in the garden. And the price of that is that some things may be eaten, but that's okay. We have um, 300 acres we can share. We've also added water features, um, nothing major, but small little retention ponds all through the garden. And that has intensely added to our reptile and amphibian population. So um, it's not just one thing, it's not just adding the plants, but we've changed our practices um, almost completely, especially since when we started out in the 1950s, this was started as a um, preserve for camellias. Um, they have moved some camellias from the football stadium. And um, at that time it was camellias, but then very quickly we started with just annuals and, and turf grass. So for a while we just had displays of annuals and turf grass. And then we moved into perennials and now we're more into native plants. So really have changed the way we view our landscape. These I got into over with all this craziness with the COVID and I was not able to come to the garden for a long time up until about July. And then in July, I started walking the garden again. And these are some of the pictures that I took. I just wanted to share with you because I like them. Um, up in the top left is a pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar on our pipe vine. That's over in the butterfly garden. This, I love this bee with this little hairy saddles. Um, this is on one of our cone flowers, the lynx spider on a cup flower, and then the erygium again with my favorite butterfly, the, uh, the buckeye. Okay. Okay, so that was our walk. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? Um, one of the questions that's coming through yeah. is, what kind of extra measures do you have to take at the garden to manage habitats that are not native to that zone, particularly the maritime forest? That is an excellent question. Um, and surprisingly, not very much. The only thing that we've done in that space is that we built a very small pond. It's probably only 10 to 15 foot across and it's very shallow, but it's just enough to keep the temperature's up just a few degrees. And so that has been the main thing that we've done with the maritime forest. Um, and as you progress up through mm -hmm. the biomes of South Carolina, you obviously change the soil structures. Nope. So do you have to, have you started, you started each biome with its own unique soil structure or did you amend what you had? Okay, the only place, there's two places where I know that they've actually changed the soil structure. One is the bog area and they dug that out. They put in peat moss and mixed it with sand. Um, and then up in the mountain habitats, there's a small space where we have Virginia bluebells and they don't do very well here because of the soil and we've added um, I want to say that it's magnesium to the soil so that they will flourish in a like five foot square. 
Aside from that, I'm not sure that we've done much amending to any of the soil. Okay. okay. Which is, yeah, the, the um, palmettos, big hole, throw them in. That's it. <laughs> and it is, it's kind of amazing to see how things can flourish when you create a density right, right. Of, of diversity. And I think part of the element to it that I didn't really talk about is that because of their, them being communities, the plants work well together, but there's also no spaces where other things can really get in. And so everything is kind of put in layers. And so you're not going to get other competing things. We don't see competing things coming in. So that density of planting and the fact that it's in layers means that you know, things can't get a toehold. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, Sue, so there's a question from the audience about the um, pine bark, the long... Um, pine leaf pine? The beetle. Oh, uh-huh. Um, ha are you having issues with that in your pine savannas and in your Pocosins? No, no. Um, the last time I heard anyone mention pine beetle, it was to do with the lo loblolly pines, which were at the pond. Um, on the other side of the garden and we lost one tree and I haven't heard anyone mention pine beetles. Um, it's probably been a good five or six years. Okay. Yeah. Um, speaking about your muley grass, again, you know, from a pest perspective, um, is your muley grass um, being invaded by muley bug? That's nope. the question that's coming in. No, it looks very healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and do you think that that's because, again, um, because you're not just plunking one individual native species into a garden, you're actually creating an entire habitat that over time has balanced itself? It could be that. It could be. Um, see, I wrote that down because I have to go ask now. But it could <laughs> be that there's, um, I don't know if that that you said mealy bug right yeah yeah mm -hmm. whether they're the birds eat them because there's so many more birds mm -hmm. um if that's an aspect to it um but no i mean our our mooly grass is phenomenal it just yeah it really is lovely yeah, it's really gorgeous and i haven't heard anyone talk about um yeah, because I'm education and I'm not in the ground staff, that puts me in a little different position because I can't speak to a lot of these like actual growing questions. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But I hear stuff, right? Um, right. And I hear when someone snuck out with the roundup and I hear when someone's, you know, and I haven't heard anything about spraying anything at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing we do use for weed control that just as a... Um, as an aside, is that they've started getting this kind of, it's like a flamethrower and it burns some of the weeds. Okay. Um, they are using that kind of method. Okay. And I think that that's a question that a lot of people have when they're doing um, significant, intense pollinator gardening is, you know, most of the pollinator plants that thrive in South Carolina do so as a result of fire. Right. And so how do you recreate that in a smaller landscape, right. like a home garden? Yeah. Has anyone ever in your botanical garden, has anyone ever broached that question with an answer? That is something that I've been thinking about because um, we talked a little bit about the native plant certificate. I would like to make the na native plant certificate something that was is done by schools and schools recreating some of these habitats if they could mm -hmm. well obviously on a school ground you can't have fire um so i contacted clay bolt and he's over the southeastern grasslands initiative mm -hmm. and there are some um protocols about mowing and ways you mow a grass uh, a, a habitat so that you can um have that fire effect but not the fire um so that's something I investigated but haven't pursued, but that's a possibility is mowing in different ways. And that sounds like something for a really good future article for our newsletter because so many of us are pollinator gardening. Mm -hmm. um, getting back to the 
I believe it was the Pocosin where you had the shell ring or the Pine Savannah, I'm not sure. Uh, the, Pocos the shell ring is down at the Maritime Forest area. Okay, and did you recreate that? Yes, we did. And it's, we brought in oyster shells from restaurants all over and those are oyster shells right there. Okay, how large is that shell ring? Um, I would say it's probably 30 feet round, like across, maybe okay. feet, yeah. It's hard to see it now. It's kind of disappeared under all the, the um, plant material. And yet, you know, the shell ring does create its own little microculture. Exactly. And that's, that's one part of the whole message of this trail is that things that you do as a individual have ripple effects in the environment. So Native Americans back millennia ago, ate an oyster, threw down a shell, and through that process have changed the, um, the plant life that exists on shell rings. So there's things that are down on shell rings that should not be there, but they're there because people made these, maybe not well thought out decisions, but decisions that change the environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one question that's coming through is, and, the, and this is because you have so many different um, ecosystems mm -hmm. in one location. Have you seen any crossover or any symbiosis that has occurred as a result of having them so closely partnered with one another? Oh, that's interesting. Because you have a, you have a very specific almost cross-cultural, you know, <laughs> um, cross-ecological um, habitat there. Yeah. Um, hmm. Not sure how, who, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just don't know. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm what I'm sure. going to do now is I'm going to let everyone, um, we've finished our chat questions, I'm going to let everyone unmute themselves. Um, I actually have a few more slides. Can I? Oh, go ahead. Those just because they, you said to do educational things. So I have yep. a few educational things and I'll just whip through those and then I can share all of this with everybody um, just so you've got it. But sure. I want to mention some resources that I felt useful. Um, <clears throat> If you want to learn more about native plants, this is a wonderful book, a uh, guide to, from wildflowers of South Carolina. Patrick is actually redoing this. Um, so they're in the process of um, reworking it and should be out fairly soon. And it's going to be put out by Clemson University Press, I think instead of, I think we're putting it out. And so um, there's going to be a revised one of these coming out very soon. Um, so that's something to know about. One of the things that I love about this book is that the, at the very beginning of the book, before it gets into the encyclopedia of wildflowers, it goes into detail. Dr. Porsche really gives you a great overview of mm -hmm. what, like you just did, of the natural ecosystems in South Carolina and what makes them unique. Yes. And that's, so if you read nothing else, read that part. Of the that book. aspect of this book is very fundamental to everything that we've done here. Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't have access to the book, um, this is an amazing website. This is a uh, lady, um, Janie, uh, Janie, Janie Marlowe uh, started this and it is searchable. When I talked about looking up, um, say, goldenrod, you can search goldenrod and you can find every single goldenrod that you can find throughout South Carolina, North Carolina. Um, and this has, if you look on the far side, plant communities, that is taken from Dr. Porsche's book. And so you can view it online there. Um, it, it's so, it, I can't even encompass how rich this, this site is. There's so many things you could use it for. Um, it's a really wonderful thing. Yeah, for example, I just learned that there are 22 different milkweeds yes. that are native to South Carolina. 
and obviously not native to all of South Carolina. Right. So if you're looking for the ones that are native to your particular plant community, um, you can find it here, or you can, I believe, find it on the National Wildlife Federation's zip code search. Yeah, yeah. As well. there are other ways um, to do it, but this is one that maybe people yeah. would know about if they knew about Ladybird Johnson or whatever, they might not mm -hmm. know about this one. Um, Native Plant Society, wonderful resource. There's local chapters, um, really great information, passionate people, all kinds of aspects of native plants. Um, little self plug. Um, I am the administrator of this program. Um, it started five years ago. Uh, I remember uh, getting this, I was in New York City, getting this published uh, five years ago. We have about 300 people enroll, enrolled in the program. Um, it consists of core classes and electives that you have to take, somewhat like the Master Naturalist Master Gardener program. However, what's different about this one is very self-paced. You take classes when you can, and um, it's very open-ended. It's not like take 12 weeks all at one time. So um, that's- Is this available online, Sue? It is. You mean the program? Yes. Well, funny you should mention that. Um, so typically it's an in-person class, but with all the situation, we've been trying to work towards to be putting aspects of it online. And that is what we're currently working on so that maybe in the spring we can get at least the very first class and some of the core classes online. Um, but otherwise it's, a, um, it's an in-person program. This, this program actually started, sort of bounced off of the um, Native Natural Heritage Corridor, uh, not Natural Heritage Garden, um, because you can come here and do a tree program and look at all the trees of South Carolina within the garden. So mm -hmm. um, that's how that sort of started. It's a wonderful program. Thank you. Um, so, and then this was my last slide. This was last year and I tried to take a better slide yesterday, but couldn't, but that gives you an idea of all of that area up to the far tree line, up to here, all of this was grass. Wow. This is the maritime forest. This is the longleaf pine savanna. This is the prairie back over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I have to say that, um, you know, with our Garden for Life initiative, we always, the, the number one rule of Garden for Life is to see your place in the big picture. Mm -hmm. And what I love about this particular talk is that you have taken all of the people from all over South Carolina and given them an overview of where they live. Right. And what they should be seeing in the native ecosystems where they already are. I also love that your process goes from the canopy down. Mm. You took a canopy down approach, the same as we do with Garden for Life. So this is a wonderful addition to our Garden for Life study initiative in that not only have you introduced us to the ecosystems, the biomes, and the plants that are special within those biomes, but you've given us kind of a formula and you've seen, you've, you've demonstrated a way in which you have made it work. And South Carolina's State Botanical Garden has set an example for every gardener in South Carolina to model. So hooray for us and hooray for you that you were able to do that. Um, were there any questions from the audience that were not already addressed? The one question was, how do you transition in your garden from one biome to another? Is it just natural or is there space in between? Do you know other than <laughs> signage that you're, tran that you're oh. being transported? Um, it's signage. It's signage based, mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, and, and I mean, you can tell <laughs> just from the plant material, you can yeah. really tell the difference. Um, but, but 
there's a, a, a less of a difference between the longleaf pine habitats. So we have the longleaf pine savanna, and then we have the long longleaf turkey oak habitat, um, and they're slightly different. And so the signage helps with that. Yeah. Okay. I'm but gonna go ahead have, and stop uh, screen sharing. Okay. If, if you can go ahead and do that for me. Yeah. And that actually is, we did about a third of the trail. So. Wow. Um, yeah. That's, I mean, that, that has just been an unbelievable experience for me. Do we have any questions from the audience? You will have to unmute yourself and just, if you would just raise your hand with a question. Sherry, you have to unmute. 